Hi everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Deepthi and uh, today we will be discussing uh, uh, a gynecological case, uh, a clinical case and uh, you know this is a, a, from a simple topic which is fibroids but I've often seen students uh, land up in confusions when they get it as an entrance exam question. So this is kind of an integrated MCQ and I will be teaching you a couple of very important things uh, with this case presentation which are specially important for central institutes and the upcoming exams. And when we say that this is an important topic for the central institutes, uh, you know, neat with the current pattern change where we are also seeing uh, most of the questions being clinical cases, uh, it is also very very probable for the upcoming NEET sessions as well. Right, so let's look at this case discussion that we're going to do today. We'll first look at the case and then we will see what we want to know about it, right? So we have a, a 45 year old woman here who has significantly heavy menstrual bleeding due to uterine fibroids. So we already know the case and we already know the presentation as well. The pelvic ultrasound shows two large uterine fibroids, one in the anterior wall, which is uh, the anterior corpus and one in the fundal region. The patient is considering uterine artery embolization. Which of the following is the best way to ensure the uterine fibroids are not leiomyosarcomas? So this is something that I said is super important for your upcoming exams, as I said, especially for the Central Institute. So we are going to talk something about leiomyoma sarcoma here, and we are going to talk about uterine artery embolization. The first important thing that I want you to know is that when you talk about UAE or uterine artery embolization, you have to know that this is not the first line treatment for symptomatic fibroids, right? So UAE is to be done for women who do not respond to medical management right as you all know the first line management for heavy bleeding uterine fi because of uterine fibroids is OCPs right so this is uh, UAE is considered when women do not respond to the medical management and are not willing for surgical management right and uh, you know uh, when we talk about uh, uterine artery embolization I would go on to the options as well but we need to talk a little about this here before we go any further uh, it is a minimally invasive method of management of uterine fibroids right and uh, you know this should be considered only in women where their chief complaint is menorrhagia right it can also be done for dysmenorrhea due to fibroids so menorrhagia or dysmenorrhea it should be considered in women whose family is complete so it is done for women whose family is complete and done if the woman is pre-menopausal and I will exactly tell you you know why we want to consider this right so this would be an ideal woman a woman who is not responding to medical management whose chief complaints are menorrhagia doesn't want to go in for surgical management family is complete and she is pre-menopausal so that would be an ideal candidate considered for UAE or uterine artery embolization as you can see in this picture this is a percutaneous method so this is a percutaneous angiographic method you know where we are going to catheterize the femoral vessels and through the femoral vessels we will reach the uterine artery which we know is a branch of anterior division of the internal iliac right so anterior division of internal iliac is what is going to give the uterine artery and the main source of blood supply to the uterus is the uterine artery although there are anastomosis with the ovarian as well but this is the primary source right now as you can see here once you have catheterized the vessels under radiographic guidance we are going to introduce these gel foam particles inside and the most common material that we use is pva okay so these are small polyvinyl particles that are introduced into the vessel and you know the blood flow would take them into the blood circulation of the fibroid so they would occlude the blood circulation and the fibroid is going to become uh, is going to shrink and obviously would uh, reduce 
that's as far as symptom presentation is concerned right now please remember uae or uterine artery embolization should never be considered if you are talking about a pedunculated fibroid so whether it is pedunculated submucosal or whether it is pedunculated subserosal especially if they have a narrow stalk why because you know uh, you know uh, very often the stalk would break and uh, the fibroid would become uh, you know uh, without the stalk and it can cause complications right the second uh, condition where you should never do this is as i said previously do not do it uh in pregnancy so we do not do this procedure in pregnancy do not do it for asymptomatic fibroids never ever okay do not do it for women who have pelvic inflammatory disease and do not do it if you are suspecting a uterine malignancy this is where the two things are related so you know when you are trying to do a uterine artery embolization you have to ensure that you are not considering a malignancy now when we have reached this to this point you know uh, let's now correlate why are we asking this question to you so now let's go back to the question and it says you know you want to do this procedure but you want to sh be sure that the the fibroids are fibroids and they are not leiomyosarcomas so leiomyosarcoma is a rare form of a uterine tumor right it constitutes only 1 to 2% of all uterine tumors and yes very rarely you know fibroids can convert into malignancy generally we say fibroids are benign they have a rare risk of converting into a leiomyosarcoma right so it is uh, there is a rare chance and when we say rare how rare it is less than 0.5% right so it is less than 0.5% which is what is the theoretical risk you know practically we say the risk is less than 0.1% but now coming to integrating things and especially the mcqs that you have to know the first important thing is presence of a fibroid a risk factor for leiomyosarcoma the answer is no so please remember the presence of a fibroid is not a risk factor for developing leiomyosarcoma right what are the risk factors for someone to develop leiomyosarcoma so you know we say prolonged tamoxifen exposure for example in breast cancer women where it is given for 5 years then exposure of radiotherapy so pelvic radiotherapy and then there can be certain malignancy syndromes where it is seen to be associated with renal cell carcinoma as well right so fibroid is by itself not a risk factor for leiomyosarcoma it can happen the incidence being very very small now when we talk about development of this leiomyosarcoma when should you suspect it you know you should suspect development of a leiomyosarcoma if you know the woman is post menopausal so yes the usual age group for developing uterine sarcomas is around 60 years of age so if you are seeing a post menopausal woman who sudden who develops a sudden enlargement of uterine fibroid uh, i am sure you all know that fibroids are going to shrink after menopause right so they shouldn't enlarge so if there is an enlargement of the fibroid we should keep leiomyosarcoma as a differential right second it will usually present as pain so because of the enlargement and it can also present as abnormal bleeding and yes it will present or can present as a pelvic mass so it can cause enlargement of the uterus because of the enlarging size so this is how a leiomyosarcoma is going to present and this is when the suspicion should arise now there are many types of uterine sarcomas out of which right the most common is leiomyosarcoma okay so the most common is leiomyosarcoma while you know the second common is endometrial sarcoma right so it is an endometrial 
sarcoma. And if I show you the gross appearance of the leomyosarcoma, this is how it looks. Now, if you look at it, it looks soft on cut section, gross. It looks fleshy. You can see areas of necrosis. And the most important differentiating feature here on the cut section is that there is absence of world appearance, which you know is a feature of, very good, yes, fibroids, right? So that's a feature of fibroids and cut section. But a leomyoma sarcoma, uh, you know, will not have this world appearance. It will be a fleshy mass, soft, and it will have areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. So that's how grossly it looks like. Now, when it comes to leomyosarcoma, uh, the important question was, uh, as I said, among the uterine sarcomas, which is the most common one. So it is leomyosarcoma. And the second I said is endometrial stromal sarcoma, ESS. Okay, so this is the second most common endometrial stromal sarcoma so most common being leomyoma followed by this now these are called as homologous sarcomas okay now why do we call them as homologous sarcomas because they are made up of native material of the uterus so whatever the uterus is made up of glands there is going to be muscle cells there's going to be some connective tissue so it is made up of native uh, you know, material of which the uterus is made up of. So they are called as homologous sarcomas. There is another category which we call as heterologous sarcomas. As the words suggest, they will have even non-native tissues. So they can have bone, they can have cartilage, they can have fat, right? The examples of, no, uh, you know, heterologous sarcomas are rhabdomyosarcoma, right followed by or liposarcoma right so these are examples of heterologous so we could actually ask you in the exams which is more common is it homologous sarcomas or is it heterologous so the answer is going to be homologous sarcomas right so uterine sarcomas are rare tumors they constitute one to two percent out of which this is what you need to know as far as the classification goes now comes to the point of making a diagnosis. Since we should not be doing a UAE if you're suspecting a sarcoma, that is why we want to, you know, this, this, that is why this question arises. Let's look at the options now. Endometrial biopsy and uh, dilatation and curettage are, you know, almost the same things. The difference being that the biopsy would be done in an OPD-based procedure, whereas, you know, a DNC would be an OT-based procedure. The idea of both is to get a sample of the endometrium, right? Uh, and this is particularly done to rule out endometrial cancer because the presentation of sarcoma and endometrial cancer can be very, very similar. So they can both present with abnormal uterine bleeding, right? So these are practically done to, you know, ensure that there is no endometrial malignancy, but they do not really confirm the sarcoma. Okay, then let us look at serum markers. So that's why we rule out endometrial biopsy and DNC. So here the question is not asking you which all procedures will you do. So yes, if they ask like this, then pre-operative we will do an endometrial biopsy to rule out malignancy of the endometrium, but not confirm the diagnosis of a sarcoma. Here the question is how do you best confirm the diagnosis of the sarcoma? So let's look at option E now. Serum markers for CA125 or CEA. Now, you know that both these are markers of ovarian tumors, right? So they're actually markers of ovarian tumors. They're not markers of a sarcoma. Sarcoma usually doesn't have a, you know, a serum tumor marker. But yes, sometimes, sometimes we have seen in studies that CA125 may be raised in women with uterine sarcoma, but it is absolutely not diagnostic, right? Because it's it's such a common tumor marker, it is not diagnostic, which leaves us with two other options. So is it going to be a magnetic resonance imaging procedure or is it going to be a percutaneous biopsy? There is no doubt that MRI scans can be used to differentiate uh, a fibroid uh, from a leomyosarcoma, but they do not confirm the diagnosis. There are a lot of overlapping findings in a sarcoma and a fibroid, especially if the fibroid undergoes degeneration, 
right and leiomyosarcoma is a kind of uh, a degeneration a malignant degeneration right so mri although is one of the pre operative uh, procedures that we could do but it does not confirm the diagnosis so which means the answer is going to be percutaneous biopsy of the fibroids so please remember the diagnosis of a leiomyosarcoma is basically a hpe or a histopathological diagnosis right so for a diagnosis of a leiomyosarcoma it is going to be histopathology most of the times as i said it presents as a post menopausal woman who presents with bleeding enlargement and the management is a tah with bso right so a total abdominal hysterectomy with bso and only after doing the hysterectomy when you send the specimen you confirm the diagnosis so that's how you get a hpe specimen but here we are talking about a pre operative procedure before you know we want to do a ua then yes you can consider doing a percutaneous biopsy from this fibroid sending it for histopath and then finding out whether there is a uh, malignancy or not and when you talk about that the diagnosis is histopathological you know um, we use the stanford criteria right and in this the classic findings with leiomyosarcomas will be nuclear atypia there's going to be coagulative necrosis and there is going to be a high mitotic rate so those are the histopathological findings that will differentiate it from the fibroid uh, please remember as i said a postmenopausal woman presenting with a sudden enlargement of a fibroid may be presenting with uh, as a mass or abnormal bleeding the man you have to keep leiomyosarcoma as a differential and the management has to be a tah with bso right uh, i hope you have found the discussion useful and uh, you know stay connected with us if you want to uh, uh, you know learn such a clinical case discussions we'll keep coming up with them in different subjects uh, stay connected on the dance daily youtube channel uh, best wishes